In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge both the living and the dead. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria Patri et Filio, The first sorrowful mystery is the agony in the garden. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, Sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula secula amen. O my Jesus, The second sorrowful mystery is the scourging at the pillar. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria Patri et Filio, O my Jesus. The third sorrowful mystery is the crowning with thorns. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria Patri et Filio, O my Jesus. The fourth sorrowful mystery is the carrying of the cross. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria, Patri et Filio, O my Jesus, The fifth sorrowful mystery is the crucifixion and death of our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria Oh my Jesus Hail, Holy Queen. Pray for us, Holy Mother of God. 
Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down with mercy upon thy people who cry to thee. And through the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of St. Joseph, her spouse, of thy blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all thy saints, grant that we may be meditating upon these mysteries of the Most Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same Christ, so our Lord. St. Michael the Archangel. Lydney of St. Joseph, Lord have mercy on us. Lord have mercy on us, Christ hear us. God the Father of heaven, God the Son, Redeemer of the world, God the Holy Ghost, Holy Trinity, one God, Holy Mary, St. Joseph, illustrious Son of David, splendor of the patriarchs, spouse of the Mother of God, chaste guardian of the Virgin, Foster Father of the Son of God, Watchful Protector of Christ, Head of the Holy Family, Joseph Most Just, Joseph Most Pure, Joseph Most Prudent, Joseph Most Courageous, Joseph Most Obedient, Joseph Most Faithful, Mirror of Patience, Lover of Poverty, Example of All Who Labor, Glory of Family Life, Safeguard of virgins, mainstay of families, solace of the afflicted, hope of the sick, patron of the dying, terror of demons, protector of holy church, Lamb of God who take us away the sins of the world, Lamb of God who take us away the sins of the world, Lamb of God who take us away the sins of the world. He has made him master of his household. Let us pray, O God, who in thy unfathomable providence was pleased to choose blessed Joseph for the spouse of thy most holy mother, grant that we may deserve to have as our advocate in heaven him whom we revere as our protector on earth, who liveth and reigneth world without end. To thee, O blessed Joseph. O Lord, grant us priests. O Lord, grant us holy priests. O Lord, grant us many holy priests. O Lord, grant us many holy religious vocations. O Lord, grant us many holy Catholic families. St. Pius X, St. Isidore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. So just a quick 
practical announcement before we begin the last conference. Uh, Holy Mother Church grants a plenary indulgence to all who attend the conferences of the parish mission. So after the benediction this evening, I will give the special blessing that grants that indulgence. It is granted under the usual conditions of confession and communion eight days either before or after. And also prayers for the intentions of the Holy Father. And the, um, of course, the most difficult one, having no attachment to sin in our soul. So that will be, again, right at the end of benediction this evening. I mentioned rather briefly in the first conference on Sunday night the, a couple of principles in which, with which we regard sin. So we said that we measure the gravity of an offense by the dignity of the one who is offended. And since God's dignity is infinite, sin is of infinite gravity. And then we said that we measure the value of a good act by the dignity of the one who performs it, which is why man can never make up for sin, because man, his dignity is certainly not infinite. But our Lord Jesus Christ is God. His dignity is infinite, which means that every single action he performs is of infinite value. Even the smallest action is of infinite value. And so that brings the question, if he wanted to redeem us, if he wanted to make up for sin, he didn't have to die on the cross. He could have pricked his finger, shed one little drop of blood, and that would, little drop of blood would have been more than sufficient to satisfy for every sin that ever has been or ever could be committed. And so, of course, that's the question. Why go so far? Why should every drop of blood? That's what St. Thomas is asking. Why does he do this? Why does he go so far? We've seen a couple of reasons that St. Thomas looked at already to impress upon man the horror that is sin, to give us an example of all the virtues, but most especially the one we will see tonight, that man may know how much God loves him and be invited to love God in return. That is something which is, in fact, the greatest reason, the great pinnacle, why Christ suffered all this, even though he didn't have to. God, as far as we are concerned, there's nothing he wants more than to be loved by men. It's a great mystery. My delights are to be with the children of men. St. Thomas Aquinas will look will ask the question, why did God create? Why did he go through all this trouble? Because certainly we have been nothing but trouble for him. Why did God create us? And there can be no reason in God himself. God in the Blessed Trinity was perfectly happy without us. It's not as though he needed someone else to keep him company. He was perfectly happy with all the three members of the Trinity. So why did God create? There's nothing we can give God. St. Thomas will look through different reasons and eventually arrive at the only possible reason. The only reason possible for God creating us is love. Deus caritas est. God is charity. He created us to share his own infinite happiness with us. That's the reason we exist. Anything that exists is because God loves it which, incidentally, as a tangent, means that we should never doubt God's love for us. The very fact that we exist is proof against it. If God didn't love us, simply, we wouldn't be here right now. The fact that we are means God loves us, and that's why we exist. 
God loves, and of course, as any lover, he wants to be loved in return. But love requires the use of free will. Love is not something that can be forced. If you have someone who takes a gun and points it at you and says, do you love me? You will say, yeah, sure, whatever you want. Just put the gun down and let's talk about this. But you can't, that's not real love. You can't force love. It requires freedom. It necessarily entails the capacity to choose not to love. Love is essentially free. And so God wants to be loved by us, which means that he's going to have to give us free will. Even though he knows full well in advance just how much we would abuse it. He wants to be loved by us. That requires freedom on our part. We throw that chance away. And God offers us a second chance through the redemption. And here, once again, he could have, in a certain way, forced us to receive the fruits of the redemption, almost in spite of ourselves. That's kind of what Martin Luther thought. God just covered everything up. Whether we like it or not, God took care of everything. Or even John Paul II, just by the fact that God became incarnate, he sanctifies all men. But it's not true. We still are free. In order to love him, we have to remain free. He wants us to love him. That requires that free choice on our part to accept the redemption or not, to refuse even this second chance. And so he goes about working our redemption in such a way as to impel us as strongly as possible without forcing us to love him. And that is why he goes to such an extent. He says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. By being lifted up on the cross, by showing how much he loves men, he tries as much as he can to draw out our love for him. St. Thomas, I'm translating it using the word that men are invited to love God in return. In fact, the word he uses means almost more like driven, challenged to do so. So the primary reason for God suffering so much as he did was to show us the depth of God's love for us. And that's something that's very important because there's absolutely nothing the devil wants more than to convince man that God does not love him. We see that at the very beginning, even in the Garden of Eden. The devil tells Eve, if you eat this fruit, you shall not die. God told you you will. He's not telling you the truth. No, you shall not die. For God knows that in whatsoever day you shall eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as God's. The devil introduces, he destroys that confidence in God that Adam and Eve had from the very beginning, that simplicity. And he introduces this idea, God, he lied to us. He's trying to keep something away from us. He's trying to hide something from us. He is jealous of his power. He doesn't want to share that with us. There's nothing the devil wants more than to convince men that God does not love them. He convinced our first parents, and he wants to destroy it in us as well. And so he tempts us with many reasons to doubt God's love for us. One of the big ones, God, he doesn't care about us. Look at all of the calamities in human life. How many people lose the faith because something horrible happened to them or to someone that they loved. And they thought, if God was so good, he would not have allowed this. He would have intervened. And it's undeniable. There are many tragedies in life. But we cannot look only at the tragedies. We have to look also at all the blessings of life. 
All too often, we focus just on those things we have to suffer, just on our dissatisfaction. And that's something that the devil loves. He loves it when people are dissatisfied. The revolutionaries, the communists, the socialists, it's all the same thing. They all work on that one thing, make men dissatisfied, make the lower class resent the higher class or whatever. Make men dissatisfied. And once men are dissatisfied, you can get them to do whatever you want. And so we often fall into that. We look far too much at our difficulties, at just what the crosses we have to carry. If we instead looked at the many and much more beautiful things that God has also given, we would see that in fact they vastly outweigh the few and paltry things that we have to suffer. There are some of those things there, it's true. But God has added on top of them to our lives an immense number of truly tremendous gifts, even just on the natural level. If we just simply look at how the world works, how the seasons follow one another, it's magnificent how all of this was designed. Why? Just for human beings, just for us. If you look, for example, at all the stars and see all the beauty of the stars, the scientists are amazed. Why? How can we not say that there's extraterrestrial life out there? Because there's just so much, the universe is so vast. Why would, if you're a scientist who believes in God, why would God create all of that and there not be any life except on this one tiny little speck? The answer, perhaps, is just because God wanted to give us something to look at, something beautiful to see, to contemplate, and to learn thereby his love for us. If you look at a beautiful sunset, these things, sometimes they come and they go. It's like the snap of fingers. You have a camera, oh, it's too late, it's gone. Perhaps God from all eternity knew that I would be just in this, po this position right now to see that sunset in all its glory just at this moment, and maybe no one else is. He did that just so that I could see it and be made a little bit more joyful by it. And perhaps also think of the majesty of my creator who does such things for so little a creature. We can look at all these things of divine providence, these beautiful things God has made just for us to appreciate. We have to remember the beautiful things in life, the many, many gifts God has given to us. And if we put them alongside the difficulties, we will see that the difficulties really are not that great. But then there's another temptation the devil comes up with. When God sends crosses, when God sends chastisements, there it seems, there it seems God does not love us. We look at all these things, trials, difficulties, wars, whatever else, it seems there that that's a sign of enmity from God. But that also is not true. That also is actually a sign of love from God. We read in the scriptures, those whom God loves, he chastises. I don't know where I heard this story, but it was a story of a priest, I think one of our priests, who was talking to this nine-year-old girl and this nine-year-old girl told him, Father, my mom doesn't love me. And the priest asks, well, why do you say that? You can't say something like that about your mother. Why do you say that? And he's thinking she's going to respond, because she doesn't let me do what I want. She doesn't let me go out with my friends. She doesn't let me have the toys that I want. She grounds me, whatever else. But this little girl said, my mom doesn't love me because she gives me whatever I want. She lets me have anything I ask for. And that priest was very surprised at the wisdom of this young child. Because that's true. A good parent 
They discipline their children. They want more than anything that their child grow up to be good, to be virtuous, to be a saint. A bad parent, oh here, just get away from me, leave me alone, I'll give you what you want as long as, it, as, long as you stop bothering me. That's not real love. Real love is something that causes, there is that necessity sometimes to chastise because we have to, we want the one we love to be virtuous, to be good. And so it is for God, God who is the best of fathers. Those whom God loves, he chastises. I will cite one other example from the scriptures. This one's from the book of the Apocalypse. It's one you're all familiar with. At the beginning of the Apocalypse, St. John is given several messages to write to the different bishops of the province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. So there are seven bishops to whom he is writing. And one of these bishops, the poor Bishop of Laodicea, receives this very harsh rebuke with which you're all familiar. Because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will begin to vomit thee out of my mouth. Something we're all familiar with. Probably the harshest rebuke in all of Holy Scripture. But note what God says just after that. Oftentimes when we read that passage, we stop there. You have to continue several more verses. Because thou art, hot, thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and made wealthy and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold fire tried, that thou mayest be made rich. And then, such as I love... I rebuke and chastise. So you have this poor bishop who receives one of the harshest rebukes ever recorded in Holy Scripture. And just after it, God tells him, such as I love, I rebuke and chastise. God is telling him, the only reason I'm telling you this is because I love you and I want you to change. I don't want you to continue down this bad road. So these things, these chastisements that God does sometimes send, they're actually motivated by love. They aren't signs of enmity from God. A real sign of enmity from God is to let a person continue on their merry way to hell unchecked. If God intervenes, if God sends some difficulty, some cross, it's precisely because he loves that soul. It's precisely because he's concerned for their eternal salvation, for their happiness. He wants them to be happy, and so he knows they need a little bit of a slap. So these things that God sends, it's because he loves us. We could go on speaking of all these different things that God sends to show his love for us, but of course, there's no greater proof of God's love for us than the extent to which he was willing to go for our redemption. Our Lord Jesus Christ says that himself. Greater love than this no man has, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It's the greatest proof of God's love for us, the extent to which he was willing to go. St. Paul even takes it a step further than our Lord did. Our Lord says, if he laid down his life for his friends, St. Paul says, but God commends his charity towards us because when as yet we were sinners, according to the time, Christ died for us. Much more, therefore, being now justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, shall we be saved through him. If, when as yet we were sinners... If when as yet we were God's enemies, God died for us, what's he not going to do now that we are at least striving to be his friends? There's no limit to what he, would, he will not try to do. 
But then we can look again at another temptation from the devil, especially one that comes after sin, this temptation that God doesn't love me anymore. And there, the temptation is actually the strongest. Perhaps, through my guilt, I find myself to be detestable, unlovable. That's what Judas thought, and that's why he didn't repent. That's why he went and hanged himself. He, like sometimes we all too often do, he projected that same attitude upon God. He thought God thought the same thing about him that he thought about himself. He was so disgusted with what he saw. Sometimes, with God's grace, we receive the grace to see the truth of what we really are in front of God. We can see all that God has given me and all that I have unabashedly misused. It's a great grace to be able to see that. The natural effect of this is ordinarily a great confusion, a great shame, and a great fear. But then God, once again, enters into the picture, this time with his merciful love. And I see, I'm reminded when I look at the crucifix, of all that God has done for me. Not just how he has forgiven me all my malice and my stupidities, but far beyond that, how he has taken them all upon himself. How he has, if we can say this, wooed my soul in spite of the incredible cost to which this wooing has driven him. He's trying to seek my love. He loves me and there's nothing he wants more than that I return that love. And so he does everything for me, arranging all the beauties of nature, directing my life in every detail, the family into which I am born, the persons I meet, the circumstances that guide me to this point. He arranges all of that. We can see that even in the lives of those who do not and will not love God. How much trouble he goes through to lavish his love upon those who will never return it. He still gives them so many good things because he knows he won't be able to in the next life. And so he does it now. But how much more does he give to those who return that love? It's one of the most beautiful things to think about, just how much trouble God has gone through to try to entice me to love him. There's a beautiful passage in the book of Jeremiah, which is unfortunately mistranslated, or not translated very well, in English. So it's the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 7. The words in Latin are, Seduxisti me domine et seductus sum, fortior me fuisti et involuisti. The Douay Reims translates it as, You have deceived me, O Lord, and I am deceived. In fact, it's not quite the sense of the Latin. The Latin is, You have seduced me, O Lord, and I am seduced. You were stronger than me, and you have prevailed. St. Thomas comments on the label of seducer, which the Jews give to our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says that Christ is the real seducer. He says a person can be called a seducer in two ways, either because he leads one away from the truth into sin, and this, of course, does not apply to Christ because he is the truth. Or he can be called a seducer because he leads one away from what is false. And in this sense, Christ is called a seducer. And he concludes, would that all of us were called and were seducers in this sense. But it's a very beautiful idea. You have seduced me, O Lord, and I am seduced. You have been stronger than I and you have prevailed. It means that I struggled against you. I did not want what you came to give me, but you were stronger than I, and you have prevailed. 
In fact, all of Psalm 138, 138, has this same idea. It's the idea of the soul which is trying to run away from God and can't quite manage it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy face? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I descend into hell, thou art present. If I take my wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost depths of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall guide me. And I said, perhaps darkness shall cover me, etc. All these different ways in which the soul, as it were, tries to escape from God. And yet throughout all of them, God pursues. It's a magnificent image to contemplate. Man tries to run from God, and God pursues him with the relentless energy of the bloodhound. He doesn't give up on man until he's absolutely forced to do so, which only happens after death when the sinner's ill will is irrevocably fixed against God. But until then, God uses everything he can to try to bring man back. And that's what we see in the crucifixion. Man is invited, man is impelled to love God in return. We see that magnificent example of God's love for us and that invitation to love him back. St. Augustine says, He who created us with his strength redeemed us through his weakness. He created us in the strength of his arm, but he redeemed us in his weakness. He became so weak and so helpless and such a suffering example of humanity to try to pursue my soul. The weakness of God is stronger than men. We pray that God may grant that be true in our case that he may overcome that desire to flee from him, to try to pursue our own wants. St. John sums all this up very well. Let us therefore love God, because God has first loved us. When as yet we were sinners, when as yet we were unlovable, God has first loved us. And that's the greatest fruit of Calvary. We see the extent to which God is willing to go to purchase my soul in a way in which we cannot ignore. We can't pretend that what he did there leaves our lives unaffected. Because anytime we look at a crucifix, anytime we think about Calvary, we see immediately two things. We see the extent to which God is ready to go to prove his love for me and the extent to which I am called to go to in return, to love him. God has given his all for me. I am called to return that. How can I do anything less if we think about who God is and what he's done? How can I do anything less? Of course, Human nature is fearful because we don't like to give self. That's something we all find extraordinarily distasteful. Father Boylan, in the book This Tremendous Lover, he says the following. As soon as one starts to count the cost, that is the beginning of the end of love. True love is reckless. Those who are afraid to tell their love lest they be called upon to live it, or lest it be used against them, should take a lesson from the crucifix. No love has ever been abused as the love of our Lord for us has been. We assume it, we trade upon it, we even allow ourselves to sin because of his mercy. Yet our Lord went to endless suffering in order to try to convince us of his love for us. How true that is. We abuse that love of God so much. And we are afraid to try to give him our love in return because we're afraid what that will happen. If I lay everything at his feet, what's he going to do with it? But we have to look at the example that he himself has led, has given. No love has ever been as abused as his love for us has been. We have to, we want to have that same 
recklessness that he was driven to. So the greatest reason why Christ suffered as he did, to show men how much he loved them and to invite them to love him in return. One of the great graces of Calvary is to be full of gratitude towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Gratitude is what makes saints. And there are many, many souls throughout the ages who have become saints precisely by looking at the crucifix, precisely by remembering how much God has done for me. God has given his all for me. How can I return anything less? We want to be filled with awe before this reality of God's love as manifested on the cross. Gratitude is what makes saints. We want to spend our lives loving God and making him loved. That is the only real response any human being can make when we see what God has done for us. The parish mission wouldn't be complete if we didn't mention our Blessed Mother, who I haven't spoken of much at all, or at all, in fact, but it's only because she herself wants to remain very much hidden during that whole story of the Passion. She's only mentioned just at the very end. She is the perfect example of the response of the soul towards God's, to God's love. Seeing everything that God did, she understood the horror of sin. She understood all these virtues that Christ gave the example of. And more than anything, she understood that love which animated him in this action. Saint Francis Xavier, the great apostle of the Indies, he wrote a letter once that said, in which he said, every time I forget to show the image of the Blessed Virgin standing beside the cross, I meet with rebellion from all, that I am to, from all to whom I'm preaching. Everyone, if I just present the cross, human nature, we flee away from that. But presenting Our Lady standing next to it, there's a great mystery there, and somehow that makes it all the more palatable. Bishop Fillet, I remember in a sermon once, said, once compared God to a physician, a surgeon. He says, sometimes the surgeon, he has to take the knife and he has to cut, he has to amputate. And he knows this is going to hurt the patient, but he also knows it's in the patient's best interest. He has to do it, otherwise the patient will die. And he said, the only problem with God is, of course, that he doesn't use anesthetic. But the Blessed Virgin, he said, is the closest thing that, com that comes to, that approaches God's use of anesthetic. And let's say, how does Our Lady act as anesthetic? Not by taking away the suffering. She didn't try to take our Lord down from the cross. She gave him the strength to bear it. She, by seeing her, by seeing her standing there, he realized, yes, this is worth it. And he was willing to do it, to suffer all that, for her sake, at least. And that's the same way she helps any one of us acting as anesthetic. She helps us to bear it. She doesn't take those things away, but she gives us the strength to bear them. So when we think about Calv Calvary, and we see this image of how much God loves us and how much we are called to love him in return, we must not forget to look at the side of the cross and see our Blessed Mother, because she especially has been given to her this great task of dispensing God's most beautiful graces and especially of assisting us in following Christ and our own little Calvaries. So let us always make sure to turn back to her. So I will leave you for that.
and we will do the benediction now. And don't forget, at the end of the benediction, there'll be the special blessing, which grants the plenary indulgence to all who've attended the conferences.
Oremus. Concedi misericordes fragilitati nostri presidium. Ut qui sancti de genitricis memoria magimus. Intercessionis eos auxilia nostris iniquitatibus resurgamus. Periundem Christum Dominum nostrum. Omnium fidelium pastor rector famulum tuum franciscum, quem pastorem ecclesiae tuae preas evoluisti propitius respice. Dae quesius verbo de exemplo quibus preas proficere. Ur ad vitam unum una cum gregis sibi credito beveniat sempiternam. E Christum Dominum nostrum.
Jesus Christ, our Bishop Sacramentum, our Abbey, the Passionist, to in memoriam reliquisti. Triboi quaesum lucita nos corpus in sanguinis tui sacra misteria venerari. Ur redemptionis tui fructum in nobis fugitas sensiamus. Qui vivis et regnas in saecula saeculorum. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Ghost, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints.
Benedictione omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen.